Hi there. A few weeks ago, the youth had a garage sale, a collection of other people's stuff that they wanted to sell to try to raise money for passageways, but I don't know why they call it a garage sale because we're not really selling garages. You know, sometimes they call it a yard sale, but they don't sell yards. But sometimes it's also called a rummage sale. And I think that kind of describes it really because people come and they rummage around looking for a treasure. Hmm something that they could maybe use. Mm. Margaritas. You know, at one time, all this stuff was someone's treasured possession. I mean, think about it. They had to work for it. They were willing to pay for it. They thought they had to have it. It was someone's treasured possession. But do you ever wonder what happens to all this stuff left over after people have rummaged through it? What happens to most of it is it ends up in a garbage dump. Jesus said, be on your guard. Watch out, for a person's life does not depend on the abundance of possessions. We live under this illusion that we're in control. Our, we are in control of our minds. We're in control of our stuff. But King David in Psalm 24 said, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all humans. Who, to whom does all this really belong? And why are we so willing to work so hard for stuff? Jesus said in one of his parables that the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. Notice what he says there. He didn't say that the rich man worked for an abundant harvest. He said the ground yielded an abundant harvest, which is another way of saying that God gave this rich man an abundant harvest. The rich man would be held accountable for what he did with the harvest. And in the same way, God holds us accountable for the riches that he gives to us in our lives. You see, the fallacy of this accumulation of stuff really hit me um, over Memorial Day weekend this past year. Um, as many of you might, have, uh, re might remember, it's August a year ago that my oldest sister and I, Lucy, um, we moved my parents from Cassville, Missouri to Concordia, Missouri so that they could be in a care facility. They just couldn't take care of themselves in their home in Cassville anymore. Well, I convinced my sisters earlier this spring for all of us to meet in Cassville over Memorial Day weekend to take out of the house whatever they wanted. My goal was to get rid of almost all the stuff out of the house so that we could clean it up and put it on the market for sale. Maybe some of you have gone through that with your parents as well. Well, over the weekend, Diane and I and Lucy and her husband, Paul, worked at cleaning up the yard, repairing the roof, uh, loading up furniture for my other two sisters. I have three sisters, no brothers. Um, and so um, we were helping them trying to get everything, dividing up the stuff between my sisters. I really didn't want anything that was inside the house. But after a whole weekend, I looked around and there was still a lot of stuff in the house. My dad has bookshelves full of books, most of them outdated, that really aren't worth anything. File cabinet that's 
full of files that nobody needs or wants anymore. My mom's got a file cabinet that's completely full of old patterns that she used when she made our, my sister's clothes when they're growing up. Never threw one of those patterns away. There's two bedroom suits yet left in the house and mattresses and box springs that are 40 years old. I mean, who's going to want those? There's an old Macintosh computer and a desk in there. There's a 1960s Necky sewing machine in the cabinet left over. There's all kinds of canning supplies and jars there. I can, but I already have all that I need. What's going to happen to all that stuff? The same thing that's going to happen to all the stuff left over from the rummage sale probably end up in a dump. All those things that my parents worked so hard for, sweated for, purchased and saved because, you know, someday it might come in handy again. We might be able to use it. Most of it's going to end up in a dump. Why do we, all of us, from little on, collect so much stuff? I'll tell you why. It's in Scripture. God made us humans to be treasuring creatures. That's who we are. We are made to treasure things. That's the way God made us. We can't help ourselves. Of course, God's intent is that we would treasure Him, that He would be the one to fill that treasuring hole in our hearts. But sadly, that treasuring instinct was blurred and altered after the sin in the Garden of Eden. Sadly, our eyes turn away from the Creator to what He has created. I think that's why a lot of the Ten Commandments are really about what we treasure. Don't steal. Don't treasure other people's stuff. Don't covet. Again, don't treasure other people's stuff. Don't commit adultery. Don't treasure pleasure above God's rules. And you could probably make the argument that don't kill and don't lie are treasuring self above others as well. Jesus says in Matthew 6, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Notice that Jesus didn't say, do not treasure. God knows that we will treasure he made us treasuring creatures. He's warning us about what we treasure. He says, if you treasure things on earth, here's what's going to happen to them. A moth's going to come in and put holes in that favorite shirt or suit or pants or fur coat of yours. Rust is going to take over that favorite automobile or motorcycle that you have. Your dream home is going to start to rot and decay all around you. Your precious toys are going to break. That TV and that computer, it's going to be obsolete in a year's time. Things do not last. Things do not satisfy. They cannot fill that hole in our heart. To try to gain strength <laughs> for the past several weeks, my, uh, Diane and I have been walking down 29th Street from our subdivision, and we usually head east. And about a half mile east on the sidewalk there, right past a sand pit lake, has popped up one of these ubiquitous self-storage units. They're building it right now. George Carlin, the comedian, said at one time that our houses are nothing but boxes built around our stuff. I think it's pretty true. Did you know, though, that the self-storage industry is a $12 billion a year industry? It is more, has more 
in annual income than the music industry does now. We have outgrown our houses. We have the most square footage in houses in the history of the world, and it's still not enough to contain our stuff. I mean, when I was growing up, there was no such thing as self-storage units. You know, in Arkansas, the backyard was the self-storage place there, you know, where you find the junk car, the lawnmower, the wash machine and dryer, and things like that. Again, why do we have so much stuff? That's because the chas the, between more and enough is a chasm so wide that a bridge can never span it. Think about it. Who's more content? The man with, a, with $12 million or the man with 12 children? It's the man with 12 children because he doesn't want more. <laughs> Think of the lives that have been ruined for the pursuit of more. Howard Hughes has amassed an incredible fortune. He literally owned several presidents of the United States, and yet he died a recluse, a drug abuser, mentally ill. Do you think if Howard Hughes had gained one million dollars more, five million dollars more, he would have been content? Marilyn Monroe was the talk of the town. She, too, had all she wanted. She even had a president. She died by her own hand, her life spiraling out of control. Do you think she would have been content if she would have been the cover of one more magazine, had one more hit movie? More is never enough. So what do we do? God has a solution, and it's right in Scripture. God knows that we are treasuring people, and he tells us how to use that nature in a way that pleases him and serves our neighbor, which, if we follow, says God, will have the side effect of bringing happiness and contentment to our lives. We sing a song in a hymnal with the words that says, what pleases God, that pleases me. So what pleases God? What pleases him is walking in his light, living his way according to his truth. What pleases God is what leads to our contentment and to our happiness. It's not more stuff as you can readily see. But in God's upside-down, backwards and inside-out kingdom, it's actually the opposite. Generosity pleases God. And generosity, ironically, also brings us pleasure. Miroslav Wolf, a theologian at Harvard University in a book, talks about two kinds of richness, a richness of having and a richness of being. The richness of having is insatiable. Proverbs 31 says, oops, it's all messed up. There are three things that are never satisfied, four that never say enough. The grave, a barren womb, land which is never satisfied with water, and fire which never says enough. A richness of happiness, of, of having, doesn't bring happiness or contentment. But a richness of being, that's what we really want in our lives. Rich in love, rich in joy, rich in happiness, rich in friendship. We live under this illusion that stuff will give us this richness of being, and it does temporarily, which is why we go and search for more and more. But a true richness of being 
is based on God's generosity toward us, being rich toward God. But what does that mean? A richness of being is found when we use our stuff to bless others, to bless our neighbors. It's in being generous that we discover this richness of joy, this richness of love, this richness of friendship. This richness does not rust, doesn't decay, doesn't get stolen, it's not ruined by a moth. And when we practice this God-pleasing principle of generosity, what we give lasts forever. What we give mirrors God's heart because God is a generous God. And three, what we give brings joy to the world. We use stuff the way God intended. And the result is what we all truly seek, a richness of being. We know that God is a God of generosity because he's given us the most generous gift of all. His son, Jesus, is our savior and our redeemer. And he did this, as Romans said, while we were still sinners, while we were rebelling against him, chasing after other gods, other things, treasuring stuff rather than treasuring our God. But the heart of God is one of giving. John 3.16 says that so clearly. For God so loved the world that he gave. God treasured you so much that he gave his one, his only son to buy you back into his eternal kingdom. His generosity uh, he generously and completely paid the price for our sins, removing that selfishness of sin, cleansing our hearts so that our hearts could once again treasure what is eternal, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in that, Find a richness of being. God's will for your life is characterized by generosity. A fully formed follower of Christ practices generosity, not to earn extra credit bonus points before God, but simply because of God's unlimited generosity to us, where we find true riches. We no longer treasure things because things don't last. We treasure God and we treasure God's people. We invest in God's kingdom because investing in God's kingdom changes lives, which in turn changes us. When it comes to investing in God's kingdom, do you know what the number one question I get asked about when it comes to tithing? It's not, Pastor, do we have to tithe? I mean, most people know you don't have to tithe, that it's not a requirement to be saved. In fact, tithing is there so that we would practice generosity. It's one of God's ways to help us learn how to be generous people. Tithing's not to be a burden to us. It's to help us learn generosity, which leads to happiness and contentment. What's the question I get asked the most? Believe it or not, it's, Pastor, do I have to tithe on my net or my gross income? I don't answer that question because it misses the point. God wants us to be generous because he is generous. And because God knows generosity will lead to a richness of being, bringing joy to those who practice it, and love and service to our neighbor. Generosity is the best kind of living. It's what pleases God. And as God's treasured child, it's what pleases me as well. St. Paul says, 
Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Generosity. It's what pleases God. It's a spiritual practice that helps us as well. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We stand.